We're about two minutes out. Laura is our host today, so uh, enjoy that first hour. And second hour, Tim Davis will be here as we talk about audio description with Joel Snyder. First hour, as usual, we're going to talk about everything. Oh, that was bad. Good morning and welcome to Office Hours. If you're joining us from YouTube, you can go to officehours.global to learn more about what we do. Today, we're going to do an hour of general questions and answers, and we have a rather robust panel of disability experts here to answer your questions about that. And as always, we're always taking your media, your general media and production questions. In the second hour, Dr. Joel Snyder will be with us to talk audio description. Mitchell, what's our first question? Thank you, Laura. First in uh, from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. Thoughts on the new Sony 866700? Mitchell? New line of uh, cameras from Sony. And as we've talked before, I think Alex has mentioned it's uh, in the lower end for Sony, but they seem to be populating it with uh, lots of options. Uh, Jack, I'm not sure how you're going to use that camera. As a general hybrid camera for doing still photography and video, I think it's a good choice, good price point. Um, as strictly as a webcam, I would move up to the FX30 uh, in that realm uh, because it's specifically uh, video-centric, which means that it's going to have proper cooling to run long periods of time. Um, the uh, 30, I believe, has a fan in it also, just like the FX3. So um, I would say that it's it's very encouraging to see Sony populating the uh, the lower cost uh, area and they and the neat thing about all the the uh, the new lower end sony's is they all have that wonderful auto focus that we love so much alex yeah it looks like a really good camera i i think that uh, like mitchell I, I would say that for a couple hundred dollars more i'd be really tempted to get the fx30 which is what i'm using right now um, and so the uh, so I think that it's it seems like an odd niche for Sony. Sony seems to be filling this sub two thousand dollar range um, with too many cameras. <laughs> like there's too many there's too many cameras that are just slightly different than the other ones. And I, I feel like there's not a lot of discipline there in just deciding on something in a certain price point. Um, I think that the real price points for them are something dramatically better under three thousand and something that is much more focused on what we need for under a thousand. I think if they came out with a camera that wasn't trying to be a still camera, that was just a web camera with a super 35 sensor um, that was uh, you know, $800 or $700, they'd sell as many as they could make. Next 
Next question. Next question from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Has anyone used Aladdin mosaic tube lights? It seems like these would be ideal for a panel discussion on camera. Alex? Yeah, I think that uh, Aladdin makes a lot of great flexible lights. Um, so uh, that's what they kind of specialize in. And what these lights are, are long tube lights. Um, so they'd be like the Kina flows that we've used in the past. And um, and so those uh, those long tube lights, but they're very flexible. They fold up into almost nothing. Um, so you can open up this, what we would normally have to ship and carry, um, you know, these much larger cases can fit in a backpack, it looks like, from what I've seen on the website. I haven't gotten to test them yet but it looks like a really, really great uh, solution. A little pricey, $2,200 a light, um, but for someone who's going to use it all the time for big lighting, uh, it could be a really, really good uh, solution. Very good. Next question. From Funsak Dorishi from Dharamshala, India. Hi, we have a three-person interviewer and two guest panel discussion. We have three cams, 12-channel Behringer audio mixer, Sennheiser wireless mics, and an ATAM SDI Extreme ISO. What does the panel suggest? Any additional gear? Mitchell? Um, I'm not familiar with the uh, the Behringer audio mixer, but if I were to suggest anything, I would say if you're going to do an interview like that, it would be nice to have some kind of Dugan auto mix where it's uh, adding uh, emphasis to whoever the uh, the interviewer is and keeping the other mics quiet while uh, one person is talking because the noise buildup could be an issue. Alex? Yeah, if that's a if that's what we, um, if, I think that you're, I, I mean, I don't know what lighting you have there um, for the, you just have the basic gear that's listed there. If the Behringer is an XR12, I believe that there is a auto mix, a, a, an auto mix in there, but I'm not 100% sure um, for the XR12. I know there isn't an XR18. Um, so that may be, the, if, if that's what you're actually using. Otherwise, it sounds like you're pretty good. You, I assume you're going to have tripods there for those cameras. Um, sometimes we like to put a second camera in the center so that we can move that center, one center camera around. And then uh, I'm assuming what you're planning to do is put folks on that on a table or something. And then you'll take the two, two of those cameras and shoot across like this. Um, think about how far, how wide you can make those cameras. So, so move those cameras as far wide as you can. The thing you want to watch for is if you're having... Uh, three people, and then you have these two wide cameras. Make sure that the cam the people on either side can't lean into your camera shot that's going across. But otherwise, you want to get as wide as you can with those cameras. Um, you, what we're always trying to do is see the far edge of the far the far corner of the far eye. Um, that's the that's what we're trying to get to when we move that that wide shot out. Next question. Eric Hers from Hartford, Connecticut. Eric is asking, I'm brainstorming about a new product that will rebroadcast a webinar via multicast within a single office. Lots to consider for now. My question is whether this should be sold as an appliance or software for a Windows or Mac PC. Alex? There's a lot of services that do this right now. So what I'm assuming you're talking about is um, there's unicast and multicast, and you're talking about doing a multicast uh, hardware so that it's ta not taking up bandwidth that it's not going out to the internet and then coming back in for, if you have a thousand employees in a room, in, a, in an office, even if you have a one gig connection, it can't, it can't send that content to all of those employees from the outside internet. So what we do is we use multicast and a variety of peer to peer solutions um, to, so that once it only has, it only, if it's propagating from that, um, from that office, or if it comes from the outside, it comes in as a single feed and then is propagated to everyone else uh, without that. Now, what I will say is that there are a lot of services that do that now. So um, the, the, there's a couple challenges. One is getting companies to do multicast uh, is, tri is not trivial. It is difficult. And the reason is that there's a bunch of security issues and management issues that come with it. Um, but there, so those are, that's one, you know, one, one thing you have to be kind of careful of. It's, it's a little harder to get those installed. There are also great services. Facebook has, uh, or Meta has a Facebook uh, workplace. Um, Zoom has its own propagation. There's another company called Hive that does this service. So there are other services that that provide that right now. There's a company that used to be called Contiki, and I can't think of the name of the company at the moment, but they changed their name. But they, um, but those are all company, all ones designed for these kind of internal uh, broadcasts. Next question. James Babbitt from San Diego, California says, Hi, Alex. Please describe your mobile audio, video, and lighting setup today. 
I have a pretty uh, basic lighting setup. This is the same kit. I, so this all fits into a Pelican 1510. Um, I've got, uh, it's kind of, I don't have another camera to, I should get another camera so I can show you what, what it looks like. Uh, we talked about it and I think I showed an image of it the last time I was, when I was, a week ago I was traveling. Um, so I've got an FX30 on a small tripod. I have my, um, my a laptop is sitting on what's called a, I think it's a Brocoon. It's a B-R-O-C-O-O-N. It's a, it's a, it's a little laptop uh, riser that unfolds. So it just kind of, you just kind of pull it open and you set your laptop on it. Um, I am, my camera is coming in via an A10 mini. Uh, I'm doing it through the A10 mini. The FX30 can actually plug in directly to my camera, uh, into my laptop, but I go through the mini so that if I wanted to put an image in there while I'm walking away or doing something else, I, I have that. So I have an A10 mini there. Um, this is a DPA 4066 that goes into a Mix Pre 3. Um, and that does my audio. And that also gives me my audio back from the computer. Um, I'm managing questions on an iPad over here. Um, and that's pretty, and then I've got two Nanlite uh, Pavolite 6Cs on two short tripods. And the real rule here is that it all has to fit into a 1510. <laughs> so, so it has to fit into a, a carry-on uh, uh, case. And so, um, that, and so I, I can't make it any bigger unless I can figure out how to fit it into that case. Um, and so that's, this is a, about as complex as I can make it um, before I have to get another case. Mitchell? I, sort of a sub question, Alex. First of all, you look great. Thanks. Uh, and the other is that I know the FX30 Sony camera is new to you. How easy is it to set up? Because it's just looking great. It's one of the big reasons that I, I moved to the FX30 was because it's so easy to set up. So uh, I'm able to jump in here um, because of the autofocus. I'm not trying to figure that out. Uh, it is the window swinging open is a little, it makes it a little easier for me to kind of, um, you know, I'm not kind of trying to lean into it to, to figure out what's going on there. Um, and so I found it to be uh, really easy. The only gotcha uh, oftentimes is that the, um, uh, the battery, which I realized I haven't plugged this in, so it, I might disappear. <laughs> so, so we'll figure this out. Um, but the battery is, if the battery goes dead, the camera, um, you know, is very hard to turn back on again, because you need to put a dummy battery in. I haven't taken the base out yet to make that happen. I did order it. So uh, thank you to whoever sent, I can't remember, I apologize on air. Uh, but but I, there were some suggestions on what to get, and I went ahead and, and got that. So, so, but I haven't gotten it all, all installed yet. Yeah, the dummy battery is a way to go. I've been using yeah. it on my FX3 for years. It works great. Yeah. As we go to the next question, I just want to remind our producers that we have plenty of room for questions. So, Mitchell, what do we have as our next question? Next one in from Eric Hers in Hartford, Connecticut. Eric asks, how popular are micro production products like the A10 Mini or Epiphan Pearl for corporate town hall events. Are there a lot of live meetings being streamed in corporate settings via these tools? And what other such products are there like this? John? They're very, very popular. In fact, once Black Magic started advertising, what magazine was it, Alex? Was it Time Magazine or something? You knew that you knew that uh, Black yeah, Magic was, was Time. <laughs> doing very, very well. Yeah. In addition to these two products, there's tons of people out there using software switchers. VMix probably is the leader in that market. OBS probably second, uh, and then Wirecast. So very, very popular in corporate city. Alex, yeah. So the uh, these have sold hundreds of thousands of cop of of these little A10 minis, uh, mini pros, extremes. Um, they're very, very popular. And there's a couple things that make them popular. One is they're very compact. As I have this tiny little switcher that I can throw in my backpack and be doing what I'm doing here. And so they're they're very popular that way. They're a good, just a webcam interface. They've become so inexpensive. At $300, there's a lot, of, there's not that many webcam interfaces. So now you have a lot more uh, tools, but with at the same price. Um, they uh, are relatively stable and also they have a, a, a fairly robust, um, you know, there's a lot of different apps, you know, like, so one of Mix Effect Pro is a good example of an app that, you know, really exemplify, you know, pushes what this can do and makes it a lot easier to control. So it does allow it to be in larger um, productions. One of the other things that's great about them is that they are part of a larger ecosystem. So you have this little 
tiny A10 mini, but they have a $10,000 uh, constellation and the software is the same all the way up. They just add more features. So it makes it a lot easier for them to, um, for people to go up. Now there are other companies that are doing this. The Epifan Pearl that was mentioned before um, does encoding, doesn't do as much editing, and um, but it's 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 been used for it's used for a lot of encoding in, in those areas. Also, uh, Roland makes a variety of um, pretty good uh, different video products, um, and Rode makes some really simple versions of this. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot more of this happening, not a lot less. Uh, while we kind of have this uh, fad of of going back to the office, it's probably not going to last. Um, you know, the 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 pressure against. Uh, doing that is is going to keep on increasing. Uh, so over the next couple of years, you'll probably see more people wanting to do these kinds of things at home. Uh, you're also going to see a greater need for these kinds of things to broadcast out uh, company messages. And so, uh, you know, we should probably expect to see it um, continue to expand. Mitchell, you wanted to come back in on this? Yeah, just I wanted to add one more device we just talked about. Nobody's actually used it, but uh, Atomos has a... Uh, um, a uh, ATEM mini version where the monitor has four buttons on the front of it so you can switch four sources into the monitor. The idea of the extra monitor makes it very compact and very portable. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Guess what? Meta's about to shake things up big time. They're on the brink of releasing their commercially licensed LLMA, LLM, and it's free. This is a real curveball for the big players like OpenAI and Google. Please comment. Brendan? Yeah, hi. Of course, I like to answer the questions with anything with AI, you know, and, and uh, you know, with Meta as well and OpenAI. So with the LAMA and the LLM, we have the three, but now we're going into four. So there's a lot of competition, and I think competition is great. You have Clux, you have the LLM, Google has their own board. And so there's four different competition, four different competitors. It's better than one. Um, and everyone has their own kind of special like host and co-host skills. And I think the AI is some AIs are better with writing and some, you know, make different grammatical structures are a little better. So just, I, I for me, I think, I don't know. I, it's interesting to have a bunch of them. I know, John, sorry. Yeah, so so we've been playing with Llama. It's uh, 65 billion parameter um, LLM. It, it's very good. The problem was the licensing. So they put it out there for researchers and not for commercial use. I'd love to see it for commercial use. It's, I don't know, it's it's not as good as GPT-4, but it's, it's a good LLM. And if it's free, that's great. I'd love to see it. We're using an offshoot of, of Llama called Vicuna, which is commercially available. So bring it. Alex? Yeah, I think that what's really exciting right now is exactly what Brendan was talking about and John, which is uh, the competition. You know, the competition right now is going to be intense uh, and we're going to see a lot of innovation just because everyone, everyone has to, is trying to, you know, we're in that moment where there were a lot of oil companies or there were a lot of railroad companies or there were a lot of, you know, there's all these things that we, you know, we, we've gone through in the past where there's this huge push and everyone's trying to do something and 10 years from now, it'll be down to two or three, you know, that, that are really doing all the heavy work because it's, but, but right now we're in that, that exciting moment where you don't know who's going to come out ahead. Um, even if you, even if we think we do, <laughs> it's going to still be, it's still a pretty wide open market. We're still in a very early time in this. I, it feels very mature because you sit there and open chat GPT or mid journey. I open it every day and I'm working on stuff and putting things in there. And um, it feels like a mature product, but it's really an infantile product compared to where it's going. Um, and so I think that uh, it's it's going to be a really exciting 10 years, exciting possibly in the Chinese curse sort of way, but hopefully in the uh, in the more roller coaster, uh, you know, Disney sort of way. Next question. Eric Hers from Hartford, Connecticut asked, long term, do you see CDN ingest moving from RTMP, TCP, to SRT UDP or Zixi UDP enhanced RTMP promises to support AV1. RTMP pushes through firewalls nicely, 
So why bother moving to UDP for CDN ingest? Alex? Yeah, so the problem with, with the CDN uh, ingest with, with uh, RTMP is that uh, you get it, it's chatty, so it needs to hear things back. Uh, UDP is a straightforward, I'm just going to send what, I, what I'm going to send. And, and it, it, it's a little dumber in a lot of ways. And that makes it, in some cases, more uh, resilient to uh, networks. And so uh, now what Zixi and SRT are what we call reliable UDP. So they are, um, they are able to, um, you know, they have the cross checks. Now, the problem with SRT is a little bit uh, of a better global citizen. Zixi isn't really designed for mass distribution. Um, Zixi breaks a lot of rules of the internet and will simply just muscle its way through a network uh, to get all the bits it needs to on one side. If, if for instance, YouTube uh, uh, supported Zixi, it would probably shut the internet down. Like it would, you know, because if everyone started streaming from it, because it's not, it's not waiting for its turn, it's not doing anything else. It's really designed for broadcasters and distribution partners to make sure that they get what they want out. Um, but it doesn't scale well from a infrastructural, global infrastructural per position. Um, so, so Zixi is is probably uh, not something you'll see widely distributed uh, distributed because of that. Um, SRT is probably coming up to speed now. Zixi, by the way, is the best way to do CDN ingest. Uh, so we, when we send uh, this show right now is being sent to AWS via Zixi. So, so, so we, we definitely use it because it's a very, very reliable and a highly um, uh, flexible system. So it can scale the, the bandwidth up and down depending on what's available to it. So it's a very, uh, Zixi is very powerful that way. Um, but again, it, it, it doesn't scale well from a global infrastructure perspective. The, um, uh, so SRT is coming up. Also, uh, YouTube is, um, supporting HLS now. So HLS is how, uh, when we do the HDR um, and high res really high resolution, high, ba high bit rate, um, we're sending that to YouTube via HLS, uh, which still uh, is, an, is another good way. And when, we re when you receive this, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're receiving it via HLS and that's Apple's format. Um, and so HLS and Dash are distribution formats and, and, but can also be contribution uh, formats for CDNs. Very good. Next question. From Jason Robertshaw in Sarasota, Florida, what kind of lens would be best for a Sony FX30 for use for desktop video conferencing a la office hours? Alex? So I'm using a 35 millimeter 1.4 prime. Um, so the, the, uh, this is a G series lens. It's pretty expensive. The big advantage of it is, is that it does go out. It has a, um, a very wide aperture, so I can blur out the background a little bit more than I normally would be able to. Um, and so, so the, that prime is, is, uh, is pretty useful in that area. Um, I like it a lot. You could go to a zoom, uh, to give you a little bit more flexibility. One of the problems, for instance, my head's probably a little bigger than everybody else's because I, I can't zoom in and zoom out, uh, on this camera. And so, uh, so I would be tempted to get something else, but as soon as you go to a zoom, you're at a 2.8, um, uh, aperture. And so that's what I'm trying to avoid there. So anyway, so those are the things to kind of think about there. I, I think the 35 is really good. Um, I probably would love to have a 35 and maybe something a little bit wider, um, that I have as an option, maybe as a second lens, uh, to throw in there, but with a, that nice short depth of field. Mitchell. Yeah, I concur with Alex. I have the uh, the big brother to the FX30, uh, the FX3, and I have a 24 to 70 zoom on it. It's probably sitting right close to 35 millimeter right now. And as Alex says, uh, the faster the lens, the more you can open up your uh, uh, your sensor, the more bokeh and depth of field that you can get. And of course, everybody's looking for this kind of a look, especially in a web uh, broadcast, because you don't want to emphasize what's going on behind you. You want to emphasize this part. Next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. It's amazing how the interpreters are getting up with the technical terms. Did they get a glossary of common terms before the show? Go ahead, Brendan. I think we lost our interpreter's mic. Karen, your mic is 
is uh, muted. Yes, that's a very good question. I cannot answer for everyone. Uh, there is no list or glossary that we do have. Um, so it's impossible to predict what the questions will be as well. But I could let the interpreters answer. They've been great. Do you want to answer? Allison. I did not get a list of the, the words myself. Karen? So I appreciate that. We've had four different events, so the interpreters have done a pretty good job of keeping up with all the technical vocabulary thus far. Yeah, this is a very challenging show uh, to do this in, so we really appreciate the the incredible work that the interpreters are doing. Um, you know, it's been very inspiring for us, you know, to have this this platform, um, you know, and, and make it available. So it's uh, so we're really, really excited to have all of you here. Alex, that's something we might want to think about building is a small glossary of some of the more common terms. Yep, it, it's hard because the because it's an open questions and we don't know what the questions are going to be until right before the show. Uh, it's hard to know. I mean, there's so many uh, it might end up being more work, more work that I don't know if the interpreters would have the time to even go through uh, the number of possibilities. If you look at just the last couple questions that we yeah, had, that's what I was just um, thinking about. It would be that there's huge pages and pages and pages, and that's just one percent of what gets asked on a regular basis. So I think it'd be it'd be hard. I think we're just very fortunate to have very skilled interpreters that are uh, doing a really good job at at pulling this together. Brendan, you wanted to come back in? Yes. So I wanted to add a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I work in AT, I, or I work with many different interpreters um, uh, on a daily basis. You know, we have, I have uh, roughly 30 hours of meetings a week. And when I first started, um, we had a list of interpreters that we used and we did have terms that we put down for them to learn and look at. Um, but it's really a high tech, you know, technical uh, area to be working in. Um, so some of the interpreters did study that and look at those words. And so they kind of know the common jargon. Uh, but this one is a little bit more challenging. Um, so, you know, we're not sure what comes up in these type of meetings. But if you have a skilled, qualified interpreter that they mostly can handle that and they try to do you know, their best and capture uh, the meaning of, of the content. Yes, thank you. And our interpreters are doing an amazing job. Um, let's go to the next question. Next one in from Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois. At this time, is the Mac OS Ventura a stable platform for production? Is this now the preferred platform for Mac? Mitchell? That's a trick question. And as Mickey would say, it depends. It depends on uh, whether or not all of your software is up to the task of working with Ventura and whether the, uh, if you have external uh, boards and things like that. I have a computer over here that's an old che cheese grater uh, that I can't run Ventura on because it's uh, an older uh, device that doesn't... Uh, have uh, Mac Silicon or anything like that. But I do have an M1, um, and it's not really loaded up with anything unusual. It's just everything to run Zoom, and I've had zero problems with it. Now, not everybody's results can be uh, comparable, but I'm one of the lucky ones where Ventura is working just fine. Alex? Yeah, I think that, there, that right now Ventura is, you know, Sonoma's out. I wouldn't install it on anything that I was going to do hard work with. I still have some friends that are using that are playing with Sonoma and surprised daily by things that it's doing that they didn't expect it to. Sometimes it's a bug, but a lot of times it's just features that they didn't know were there. Uh, a lot of things have been added into Sonoma, and so they just get surprised that it's doing something that they don't expect. Uh, so I probably wouldn't use Sonoma. Um, I tend to be very slow. Uh, there was one year that I got aggressive about up updating, and I felt like I paid the price for that. Um, so I. Uh, 
tend to not move my computers until about January. Um, and, and the reason for that is that the new OS will come out um, probably September, October. So Sonoma will be uh, finalized. Um, and then you want to give them some time to fix the, the, uh, the, the fi you know, fix anything that comes out in what we would call gamma. So between October and January is what we would tend to call the gamma testing, which is everybody who's using it, who just, you know, the, the a much larger sample of people than what, what were in the beta. The public betas make these a lot better because there's a, more people using it. Um, but I try to look at, I feel that uh, oftentimes Apple is focused more on WWDC than more updates at, by the end of January. So I, I kind of like to let Apple, uh, um, you know, f finish everything they were going to do with that. Uh, and then and then as they focus on the next thing, I find that to be a really safe time to update. Uh, it's the same amount of time, a one year cycle, it's just offset a little bit from Apple's release schedule. Um, I think I found that's probably the most stable way to kind of follow along these OS updates. Yeah, and I know Alex, for me, I'm still on Monterey and I don't hear that we're gonna be moving with the university anytime soon because of some of the interface differences. They're very, very reluctant to move us from Monterey to Ventura because of the difference in the way things work. I think at some point you have to embrace the future. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for the go ahead for my tea. Mitchell? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, I, I'm on Monterey with my old cheese grater. And uh, the problem with it is, is, first of all, I can't upgrade it uh, because it reached that failure point uh, where the new uh, operating systems don't take it into account. Um, the other problem is that I'm stuck with older versions of Adobe until I uh, get a new computer. And that's uh, a completely different story that we'll tell some other time. Next question. Arshid Trivedi from Daytona Beach, Florida asks, Ethernet cables are fantastic. However, what is your limit if you're trying to do a clean install to make it effective and work well? 200 feet? Is that too long? Brendan? Yeah, good question. Um, with my work, you know, I've seen it at Meta, my work all the time. Um, usually an in, like 320 or 380 feet or 280, 300, 280, 300 feet is usually fine. 308, you know, you have, you've got the whole area of it. And then, you know, about, you have about 25 feet you have for this and you have 10 feet to patch and to make sure everything goes out to the different connectors. But if you want faster, maybe fiber optic, that's a harder thing to kind of, cause you can't really flex it and break it up a little bit. So you have to use a copper fiber. If you break it, you're done. So that requires, you know, maybe something to get installed. If you're working on it, you're trying to install it and break somewhere, then you're done. So, uh, Uh, 62 miles and then you'd be able to you know for home to the next town you could do that and that's that's if you wanted to dig under the ground and you wouldn't have to do anything there with fiber optic but i would think high performance uh line in the center it's uh infinite infinite based and they have it's up to 200 gear two gig and the fiber optic is faster, but I think the Ethernet is only like one gig. And so that that NVID is more thick. It's thicker. It has a better plug-in. And I think it gets up to about 98 feet. And it has a better signal. It's um, with the wavelength. So the, there's reduced with um, discrepancy. And it's good for, you know, you can get the right things and you can put them up the different screens up on uh, like a wall or anything. And, and you can just have different ones um, throughout. John. Oh boy, is this the second hour topic? So, so category five, category six, category seven, category eight. Um, so category six is designed for one gig. You can do 10 gig on category six, but you can only go about a hundred feet. If I'm going to install anything on Ethernet in my network today, it's going to be CAT 6A, which supports 10 gig up to 300 feet or above. So CAT 6A or CAT 7 in a house, 
everybody's going to be moving from one gig to 10 gig here in the next five years. So if you want to put cable in, that's going to last. Uh, I, like Alex always says, put fiber in too, but minimum cat six a. Alex. Yeah, I'm in the process. I fortunately for me, there was a, uh, someone else that owned my house before I'd run cables to all the rooms. Um, and, uh, so there's already cable paths to the rooms. Um, and so there's, you know, there's ethernet everywhere. I'm in the process of taking that out, um, and replacing it. And what I'm putting in is, uh, one ethernet, a cat, um, most likely cat six, um, uh, one ethernet, uh, two, uh, BNC for SDI, um, and, uh, you know, just, just to make sure that I have, uh, it's just easy for me to connect and then, uh, one tack 12 to every room. So, uh, tack 12 or 12 strands of fiber. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is to make sure that I never have to do this again. So I'm going to like, you know, at, with 12 strands of fiber, if I ran out of connectivity in my house, I'm doing something great. You know, like, like, you know, really great. Um, and so, uh, so I think that, uh, so I feel like that will, that will ensure that I never have to think about, about that process again. Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm in a similar boat, uh, as Alex is that, uh, when I bought my condo some 30 years ago, um, it was bare to the wall. So I just went running wires willy nilly wherever I wanted them. But since then I've had to update it three times. I have an excellent drywall expert for doing perfect drywall work. And uh, now I'm contemplating uh, fiber and other things like BNC for SDI. And uh, the answer from the drywaller is again. So there you go. Yeah, this must be the day for it. I got up to an issue with my ethernet cable this morning and I have to go get a new 50 foot ethernet. So this is actually very helpful. Thank you, Harshid. Next question. Eric Herr is from Hartford, Connecticut asking, I have customers that broadcast their CEO town halls. And they don't want to risk any sort of a connection to a remote service provider. What video distribution technology do you recommend to scale delivery to thousands of desktops internally? Alex? As you stated before, you can build a multicast network. So there are some companies that build their own multicast networks. Um, they're not. We've done uh, multicast networks for up to about 30,000 people um, with five servers um, on the edge. So so that's a it, it can be um, done. It just takes a lot of work with your IT team to put it together. And then you're managing that. And we're assuming that you really don't want to send it off campus um, or you have to do set that network up. So you can do it on your own. Um, the, the four probably most common ones to use are Zoom now has its own solution uh, to do this internal streaming. So if you're doing a Zoom call already, being able to distribute it is something that can be done internally. Um, Facebook has its workplace and workplace has that feature built into it. Uh, there's a company, the company I forgot last time was Contiki. So Contiki, I'm, no, I'm sorry, Collective. Collective is the new name for Contiki. Uh, it used to be called Contiki, but now it's Collective. And then finally, there's one called Hive. Um, and so those are the probably the four biggest ones that we see uh, for that internal distribution. Very good. Next question. From Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul wants to know, I installed iOS beta 17 version 3 and trained it with my voice by reading 150 sentences, which took 20 minutes, and it's taking all night for my iPhone 14 Pro Max to process. Would this new personal voice sound like me? Go ahead, Alex. You're going to have to come on the sh come on after hours and show us uh, and play it out for us. I, I, we don't know. We don't, we don't know what it was. I I wish that uh, that Apple would give us a eight hour version or ten hour version where we can read it over time and uh, really build something that's near perfect. I, I have a feeling that uh, that twenty minutes is going to give us a good voice, but not an incredible voice. And I think that hopefully Apple will let us continue to. Uh, improve these solutions. Go ahead, Mitchell. I think the trick would be that they should allow you to use somebody else's voice. Like I'm a voiceover person and I don't really see the need to go to a uh, 14, but if somebody told me that I could upgrade my, uh, my old iPhone six, so I could sound like James Earl Jones, I would do it in a heartbeat. It's probably some legal issues there. Absolutely. There's probably some form of legal issue there. Uh, John Prado. 
Yeah, I haven't played with the Apple beta yet, but but the best one on the market right now is Eleven Labs, and you can train it with very short five minutes of. Uh, you could take a video off of YouTube and train it, and it's very very close. It can can it can you give it a lot more data can and yep. and then improve the model? Yeah, absolutely. How and how to how does it handle licensing with uh, remote? Like if you're taking somebody else's voice uh, with Eleven Labs, is, does it just let you do that, or is it? Yeah, it just lets you do it. Okay, for some reason I went up to their website and I thought that it was uh, it said you had to get an elect, you know approval or something but it just lets you upload anything well we have the paid version so i don't know right there's the free version and the paid version and we're paying for it yeah no, i haven't had any problems it's great this is extremely interesting too um i i'd almost like to invite brendan and brendan to jump in and ask how he feels about the idea that there could eventually be an ai um if he feels like jumping in at all um with the voice interpretation. No pressure, but uh, I just wondered. This is Brendan. Yeah, sure. I'd love to answer. So that's another thing I'm really looking forward to as well is it's having a voice for me because sometimes in some situations I can't have an interpreter. Uh, I, I don't have an interpreter with me 24 seven. It's just un impossible. And, uh, you know, I'm texting all the time and maybe my hands are tired and I don't want to text or I just feel it'd be, but, you know, I would like to tie two kinds of text. If I could sign to my phone, for example, you know, just to my, to my iPhone and, and, you know, have it right here in front of me. And if I could sign like this and then it would speak for me, that would be cool. But that's something maybe in the future and that would require good recognition software and recognition of signs. I know some people are working on it. Um, it really might happen. It's not perfect now, but maybe later it will be. It's hard to recognize some signs as well as, well, for example, if I have a voice for like, maybe if I make a video of myself and I am, you know, just working at a telecom community uh, place or like LinkedIn, if I want to talk about myself and be visual, then I have to, you know, grab an interpreter. Do you mind making this? And do this captioning for me, voice captioning. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes I have to ask for that. Or maybe there would be a female. And so I sound like a female instead of a male. So if I get a male interpreter. But if I could use male AI and then sign and have that as my voice and have that captions, then I wouldn't have to add captions later for myself and figure out a timing and figure all those those little things out. So that's why I'm low, really, really looking forward to that with AI. And hopefully that will happen. It's a must or a need. No, it's more... Uh, a thing. The problem is also trusting the AI. It's not there yet. Absolutely hear you on trusting the AI. And uh, thank you for that. I want to remind our producers, we do have a little bit more time to enter your questions and go vote on those questions because we take them in the votes are important. So let's go to our next question. Added from Eric Hurst in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, referring to an earlier question about switchers. Eric wants to know, do any of these micro production products output Dante AVH or NDI HDX3? Alex? Yeah, yeah, the, um, the, uh, not the Dante A AVH yet. Uh, I don't think anybody's supporting that currently as an output module. Uh, the um, vMix, OBS, uh, uh, Mimo, all of those will output NDI. So, um, so the software-based ones. I don't know of. Uh, I don't know of any hardware-based ones that are doing that. There might be a Panasonic switcher uh, that is that is supporting NDI, but most of the software-based ones will. That's that. That's great to know. What, you know the different ways we can get audio in and out of things. Let's go to the next question. From Douglas Carmichael, Douglas wants to know, how would you use Cloudflare Stream and similar CDNs? Would you just point uh, Mimo Live or similar software to them, or would you need a hardware encoder? Alex? Yeah, you should be able to do just point point any uh, software in, um, editing to Cloudflare. So you would be able to, to Cloudflare, it doesn't matter whether it's hardware or software, it's just bits coming in. So uh, you shouldn't need a, a hardware encoder for that. 
Very good. Next question. Next one in from James Babbitt in San Diego, California. What is the best way to record stable handheld video? Would you use a DJI gimbal or fix the video in editing software? Brendan? Yeah. I love that question because there are a lot of videos that use a lot of videos for work center. And that's how, you know, you have to repair, you have to explain it, the technology. So I have the DJI gimbal. And so if, you know, you have shaky hands, you don't want that because you don't want your picture being shaky. So that makes it extremely smooth and it can move anywhere and kind of balance out the camera. I think that's perfect. And it's a great solution. And I'm sure there are other ones, but I, I would say that gimbal is, that's one of the best ones to keep that video stable. Especially when uh, it has a controller too. So you don't have to always touch the camera. You have a little controller. You can zoom in and out with that controller and make the picture smaller or larger, whatever you need. And you can all do it with one hand. Mitchell? Yeah, I agree with uh, Brendan. I think it makes sense to use a gimbal device. I mean, I'm a post-production guy. I do a lot of editing. Sure, put it on us post guys to fix the shaky cam. It didn't mean to be shaky. Um, yeah, you can fix it. If you must do that kind of stuff, uh, make sure you shoot 4K and post in 1080 so that you have a little room to be able to manipulate the, uh, uh, the stream. Uh, the Sony cameras have a nice uh, uh, stabilizer uh, built into it, and if you use their metadata... It'll actually improve upon what's already there. And I believe the metadata will work with um, uh, Premiere Pro very well. So uh, try not to get it in the uh, post uh, business. Uh, speaking on behalf of all post-production uh, editors, it's so much easier if you deal with it up front with a nice gimbal, as Brendan said, or some other uh, method to uh, stabilize. Thanks. Yeah, the... Um Definitely the, Os the Osmo and then the RC3 are, are great uh, gimbals, but you did, now there's another one step up just so you know it's there is the, is DJI makes a 40, the 40 camera, which is this arm that uh, has incredible auto focusing based on LiDAR, has a lot of remote controls, a little more expensive. So it starts to step up a little bit, but you did ask for best and you didn't say for a certain price. So I do feel, I feel the need to give you the best is a um, a fully decked out Steadicam with an airy Trinity head um, is going to uh, be the best solution. My brother actually owns one. <laughs> he could have a really nice car, um, you know, for that for that uh, for that arm. Um, and so, uh, but he, he uses it on feature films. And so uh, that that rig is probably about a quarter quarter million dollar rig. Um, but it's a uh, uh, but it it is the best because that's what that's what you asked for. <laughs> Absolutely. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, uh, do you think we'll see personal voice and similar features appear in Mac OS Sonoma, or will it be an iOS, iPad OS only feature? Alex? It's very rare for Apple to have a feature on iOS that doesn't eventually make it to the desktop or the desktop that doesn't ev eventually make it to iOS. So the two uh, operating systems are kind of designed to work together. Uh, so I would expect it to be on both. Absolutely. Apple, Apple moves slowly. And uh, when they're ready, they put things in places that make sense. But they usually always cross-platform them between their platforms. Uh, next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. For those with older computers, specifically compact like Mac Minis, how often do you open them up to clean them? I'm swapping a drive in a family member's Mini, and I'm always amazed at how dirty they get and the throttling that it causes. Brendan? Yeah, as a person who is uh, in IT, I've been for many years. I own my PC, own PC company. Um, I really um, carry that. Or I carry a lot around and use a lot of computers. Um, I play a lot of games on them. I um, I will tell you that um, when I had my own biz business and I did a lot of traveling and uh, consulting, and um, you know, the thicker ones need more cleaning. But it's better to keep cleaning. Um, regularly instead of allowing things to build up inside. 
um, especially the high speed ones, you know, and they get hot and they get dirty. So um, we don't want anything to break inside, but the more powerful they are, you know, you need to do that fairly often. Um, they are more tolerable, tolerable now. They can withstand a lot more now, uh, but you do have to clean the hard drive now and again. So, Mitchell? I'm with Brendan. I think you need to keep it clean as often as possible. Fuzzy tumbleweeds, I call them. They're just giant, fuzzy little balls of whatever uh, is a mess. One thing not to do uh, with a computer is don't use com compressed air from a pressurized uh, air source. It's not good for the uh, the parts to have things like that blowing in there. Uh, you know, a vacuum cleaner that's made for this that doesn't uh, inject any kind of static. Make sure you're properly grounded. Uh, and uh, you can usually get a lot out with a little brushing and uh, a little bit of air cleaning. But don't hit them with a high-pressure air. That's really bad. Yes. I know when I was originally working with computers, that that was one of the recommendations was to use canned air. And now... But not so much. Let's go to the next question. Eric Hers from Hartford, Connecticut. All of those options mentioned for video distribution require a connection to a remote to a remote service. The requirement is to distribute the live video without this dependency. One option is a local Wowza server and local proxy caches. Anything else? Alex. Yeah, for the for the multi -ca uh, multicast that we've done in the past, we've done exactly that, which is a Wowza server um, with with the local caches. And again, we've had pro you know about five of them, five servers so serve up to thirty thousand people uh, fairly effectively. So that is a possibility. Uh, I will say that uh, some of the services that I mentioned, uh, if you reach out to them, uh, can provide local server solutions. Uh, they do that for. A variety of uh, government organizations and um, and others that that do require it not to leave the facility. So it's not out. They may not advertise that on their website, and I don't think I can mention them specifically. But you you sh if you're interested in that, you should reach out to the uh, to the companies directly. They do have services that do not leave uh, the facility directly. Yeah, I would think in in F particularly post pandemic. They've figured that a lot of these services it's, have figured this out because of as of the security we're under federal it, government. And such. It's been a concern for a long time. So we've been doing internal streams and internal all hands and a variety of those kinds of things for the last 15 years. Uh, so even pre COVID, these kind of concerns are something people have been managing already. And I just don't I just don't know exactly where or who makes those public. I don't know if they want everyone asking for a, a local server, but I do I can say that some of these services do provide local server options for security. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Next question. Brendan Gilbert from Fort Worth, Texas. And here in our panel, what do you think think about the future of streaming from AR glasses? Futuristic, dreamy answers are good. Go ahead, Brendan. Oh, wow. Um, I'm just going to throw this out here. Um, the glasses, the smart glasses, the Wayband story, uh, I don't know, or the, um, I would not recommend that. There's different kinds. So I know in the future, there's going to be better ones. There are going to be better hardware on them. Um, they will have, um, you know, some that connect to your phone or camera, um, you know, so that you can, uh, stream and get the signals remotely that way. Um, so I know that is, you know, hopefully soon. Um, there's no magic in that we have to, um, you know, it's going to have to be developed, but I think in the next, I don't know, I don't know. Anybody else want to comment on this? Uh, need some input on that. Alex. Yeah. So uh, the um, there's already a, a, a platform for it uh, for you know within the new Vision goggles. Of course, they have two cameras, and uh, those cameras are capable of it. And the way that yeah. Apple is managing that is what's called I, th I believe it's HEVC MV. Um, and so what it does is it has a, it it basically has a hero eye 
so typically that's going to be the left eye is going to be the hero eye. It's going to send that feed and then the right eye is sent as a delta feed um, so that if you have stereo, you'll see stereo if you have, um, but if you only have mono, you'll just see the hero eye. And so that's the, that is the, um, you know, the way that those, the headsets are designed to do that. The, the, the challenge really is that, um, uh, that the way people hold their heads, it's really important for them to see what they're shooting. Um, we see a lot of cameras doing this. Um, so when people, uh, are are watching a concert or something like that. They're bouncing around and they're going like this and they're and if you watch that on VR, it'll make you very sick. So um, so the uh, because in, you know it's it's something that you know what's happening is is your eyes are seeing something different than what your inner ear is is feeling. And any time for a million years up until the last very handful of decades, any time your eyes did something that your inner ear didn't feel, it meant you were being poisoned. And so you. <laughs> ejected everything out of your body so so the um so anyway so it's important to uh uh to you know uh, not do that and so so typically when we think of vr you have to think about how to you know settle down and and just shoot something and let people explore it a little bit more um, i'm really interested to see if in this version of the iphone or the next version of the iphone we see uh, you know, these, these two uh, lenses become a stereo capture device um, so that it can be delivered. Now, these may seem, uh, these lenses may seem too close together, uh, but we've already seen uh, red with the hydrogen uh, do lenses that were actually closer than that and get relatively good stereo using uh, machine learning. So, so there's, so there's ways to get that even there. I would love to see a lens on here and then a lens over here that's inner, you know, interocular, uh, distance. I don't think that I don't think that Apple will do that. Although I think it would be amazing <laughs> if they did. Alex, do you think that uh, that Apple could actually get to a place where we could, um, in real time, wear these while walking or moving and be able to stop and zoom in, like on a on a um, a street sign or something, particularly for the visually impaired? Right now, yeah. they have smart glasses, but you are not permitted to wear them if you are moving. Um, I, I think that eventually you're going to see that kind of thing, but I think it'll be the next version or a couple of versions in the future that are much lighter and allow you to see uh, more clearly to the outside. Apple, most of their guidance right now is to sit down, <laughs> you know, to, to sit down and, and be part of that experience and not move around as much, even uh, because uh, they're concerned for safety issues. Uh, I will say that Google Glass was very good at this. Um, so when we had a Google Glass, you could, you, the the nice thing is you had a little viewer and you could simply look up a little bit and see, get all kinds of extra information about what it was what it was doing. It's still one of the best um, for that kind of heads up display of the world around you. Uh, it's unfortunate that the camera was abused in a way that had people not like it, but it was incredibly powerful. Yes. And uh, I, I just, I think that's going to be a game changer. Brendan, you want to jump back in on this? Yeah, sure. When you were talking about the inner ear and uh, being, um, you know, connected to your eyes, you know, I really um, am a visual person and get all of my information visually. So it does, you know, affect that. Um, so you have to stay focused on this one area kind of in front of you. And it's also, you know, a balance issue, um, you know, with the camera and your phones, uh, you have less field of vision, uh, maybe with that product, um, you know, the Google glass you were just talking about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm expecting the TCL to come out, um, and I'm expecting that product to explode and, uh, you know, catch up with things and that and the other things will have to catch up with that one so yes very good um it's this is going to be a very interesting space to keep an eye on next question next in from douglas carmichael i just started learning swift with unwrap that's the ios learning app of hacking with swift and the structure of the app really resonated with me how would hacking with swift plus compare with code with chris Go ahead, Alex. If it's working for you, then it's perfect. <laughs> so, so what I would say is that it's you know what what's most important if 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 you have something that you're learning from 
and it's working. I wouldn't worry about one being better than the other one. I would just say, well, this one works for me and, and grab onto that one and start, uh, start coding. Very good. Um, next question, probably our last question for the hour. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Claude 2 AI will analyze up to 100,000 tokens are near as many words as do much of the same things the chat GPT code interpreter will do. But it's free. Why bother with chat GPT? It's free. John? Every time a new LLM comes out, just, just ask it this, Paul. When I was born, my mother was in France and my father was in the United States. Where was I born? And every one of them has gotten this wrong except for Bard. Bard's free and Copilot's free. I've been playing with Claude. I'm not impressed. Brendan? Right. Uh, there are different choices, you know. Um, one of them is not so great, um, but you can't compare them to other ones. Um, you know, we're still waiting for Claude to see what happens and see what kind of improvements are made with Claude. So I've been using the other one for a while. So, um, you know, we'll have a better answer maybe in the future. Very good. And I want to thank everyone, our producers and our panelists for all the answers in the first hour. Remember, um, if you go to the email tomorrow, we do our Sunday, our standard Sunday introspection, which is a little bit of a slower, more meandering walk through office hours, um, which is not streamed to YouTube. And then uh, Monday, I believe we're, Liberty is going to help us cover time management in the second hour. And now I want to hand it to Tim as our host for our second hour and let him introduce our, our guest. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for another Accessibility Saturdays. And we're excited today to talk about audio descriptions. And uh, just a quick explanation, audio descriptions make images make visual images accessible for those that are blind or have low vision. Um, so we have with us today, Dr. Joel Snyder, and uh, we're gonna have a, a good discussion. There's already a, a great number of questions coming in, but uh, before we get to those, I just wanted to do let uh, Joel do a quick introduction. And uh, so Joel, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you're connected to this field of audio descriptions? And Joel, you're still muted. There you go. Look at that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. The um, Golly, I started with audio description 42 years ago uh, with the world's first uh, audio description service, which began in the Washington, D.C. area, which is where I am based. Uh, it uh, was a function of, it began in performing arts, a function of the Washington Ear, which is a radio reading service here. Uh, I had already been volunteering, um, working with them, reading newspapers on the air, principally for people who are blind uh, or have low vision. And in 1980, um, we, we began this service uh, along with Arena Stage uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. So I've been doing audio description right from the very beginning as a formal ongoing service. Uh, so uh, and ended up, uh, I've taught description all around the world and have my PhD in audio description, which is possible to do in uh, in Europe, uh, principally, where it's studied as a kind of audiovisual translation, and then wrote the book on uh, on audio description, the visual made verbal. So uh, anyway, that's a little thumbnail sketch for you. Excellent. Thank you. And, and for those, uh, I have my copy of the book, Electronic. Oh my goodness. Joel, I'll Look get you to sign this at the yes, end of that's the... Right. <laughs> Since it's a virtual book, we can sign. I will reach out and yes, yes, <laughs> write my um, name on my screen, and then I'll I'll hate you. 
the you know I think a lot of people are familiar with the the little CC button, uh, and a lot of folks yeah. may have seen AD uh, you know in the title of a video for audio descriptions. But can you just explain a little bit about what what audio descriptions are and what they might sound like? Right. Well, in a way, it is for again principally for an audience of folks who are blind or have low vision. It is to them what captioning is. Uh, for an audience of people who are deaf. Um, you know, when we began at uh, Arena Stage 42 years ago, um, it really was a matter of Margaret Fanstiel, blind woman, who uh, and, and a blind man, Chet Avery. Margaret ran the Washington Ear, and they were on this committee at Arena. Uh, they had, Emory, Arena was eager to demonstrate for the committee they had just installed an assisted listening system, which allowed uh, folks with hearing loss to access sound, nothing but a microphone on the stage, and the, the the sound is transmitted to people with these receivers, and they can crank the volume up. Margaret and Chet were impressed, but of course they wondered, hmm, could this be used for us? We're blind, we're not deaf, we don't have hearing loss. If it's just a microphone on the stage, couldn't that microphone be held by someone off stage, observing the action on stage and using the pauses between bits and pieces of dialogue or critical sound elements to voice description of action, of, um, of facial expressions, of costumes perhaps, that sort of thing. Arena to their credit said, let's give it a try. We have two channels, we can do that. And uh, that's, how it, that's how it developed. Audio description um, is an accommodation, an access tool uh, again, principally for people who are blind or have low vision. You, you know, Tim, I think of it as a literary art form. It's first and foremost about, about words. Um, and I, I narrow that, actually. It's a kind of poetry, in a way. Uh, in fact, I think of it as a haiku. And I say that because we use as few words as possible to convey a, a verbal version of the visual. The visual is made verbal uh, and aural, A-U-R-A-L, he points to his ear, and aural, O-R-A-L, he points to his mouth, using, again, as few words as possible, words that are succinct, vivid, imaginative, uh, to bring that visual image to a, a group of folks who are uh, otherwise uh, would not be able to access culture. Uh, in 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 a in a more full in a more satisfying way, and speaking of that population of people who are blind, you know the American Foundation for the Blind now says there are over 32 million people in the U.S. alone who are either blind or have trouble seeing, even with correction, meaning low vision, um, and and of course. <laughs> Audio description can be great for the rest of us, the rest of us meaning sighted folks who see, but we don't observe. You know, we don't really notice. We let the visual images in our life just wash over us. I oftentimes will say description is great for sighted folks who want to be in the kitchen making a sandwich while the TV is on in the living room. You don't miss a beat because you can hear what you can't see, not because you're blind, but you're in the wrong room. And it has been shown to be helpful to people with ADHD, to people uh, on the autism spectrum, to people uh, learning a new language, or simply building literacy, uh, because you hear increased vocabulary, you hear uh, synonyms, uh, you hear similes and such, and it helps build one's level of literacy. So there really uh, are a number of audiences for audio description, um, again, including uh, sighted folks. Um, it, it really is, it's helpful. It's great for anyone who wants to truly notice and appreciate the a more full perspective on a visual image but especially helpful as an access tool for people who are blind or have low vision. And now, you know, 42 years later, uh, my goodness, I have provided description at literally thousands of arts events, performing arts, but meaning not just theater, dance, opera, uh, museums, media, 
uh, we started with uh, uh, broadcast television and then went to VHS videotapes and then DVDs, and now it's available in streaming services. So performing arts, uh, uh, museums, media, but, but you know what? I've also, I've also provided description at weddings, at, um, oh, uh, parades, rodeos, uh, at circuses, uh, at all manner of sporting events. Uh, I've even described funerals. So wherever the visual image is critical to an understanding, he points to his head, and an appreciation, his hand is on his heart, of the visual image. That's audio description. That's great. And Joel, <laughs> thank you for describing your mannerisms. Um, you know, one, <laughs> one thing we have uh, we have not done on this uh, show yet is self description. Self descriptions, right? Um, which is a very important piece of this, right? Well, it, it is um, if it's done correctly and well. I mean, oftentimes uh, people, people will just jump in and say something about themselves, and uh, but you know, oftentimes I I say in training, I, I mention the phrase that we all know: a picture is worth a thousand words. Well. A blind person doesn't really want to or need to hear a thousand words about a particular image. So editing down what it is you will describe and then editing down the words you will use to do the description is really critical. So sometimes self-descriptions get like a minute or two minutes. If you're meeting with 30 people, meeting is over by the time you've just everybody's described themselves <laughs> and and actually among the blind community there's a debate there there's uh, you know is it let's not waste time with it you know let's get to the point of the meeting uh i i don't need to have a visual image of what everybody looks like around the meeting i let's get to the point it, you know so there's a little bit of debate there now you know i oftentimes this comes up all the time and some some uh, clients or presenters will insist uh, well, I've heard this is an important thing, and we're going to describe ourselves as we go along. And I will say that I am a, a white man, uh, middle-aged, um, with a, um, a receding hairline. All right, all right, it has receded. Darn it, it has receded all the way to the back of my head, leaving a fringe of white and gray hair reaching around to the front of my face, extending into a mustache and full beard, which uh, covers a multitude <laughs> of chins. Anyway, that's that's my little uh, thumbnail self description. Uh, but you get into all kinds of issues. You know, um, I'm a white man. It, well, white is is qu race, quote unquote. Is that a critical element to every description of any person? I don't know. Is it critical? to that understanding and appreciation of the story of the of the work of art that the artist has created. So it's um it's kind of a, a discussion, an important discussion point. You had mentioned earlier that you had an example uh, to show us. Is that something you could show us now and kind of let I, us get I would a little be taste? happy to. Yes. Let me um let me get uh, together on that here. The the um what I'd like to do is show you just, I guess I want you to experience a cultural event, just a little excerpt of a major feature film, but I want you to experience it as it would have been experienced in the movie theater by a blind person 25 years ago, say, before description was prevalent in movies. Uh, I want you to experience it just hearing the original soundtrack. No, no description, but no image. I'm not going to show you an image. I'm just going to play the original soundtrack. This is a, a major film, The Color of Paradise. Uh, you may have heard of it, it's 25 years old, something like that. It's a marvelous film. And, um, um, but I, you know, it's, it's a professional film with a professional soundtrack. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. And um, you should have no problem following it, right? Because you'll just listen uh, to the sounds, right? And, and get from it what you will that shouldn't be that shouldn't be a big problem should it uh tim i don't know let's oh. make sure i've got everything uh together here uh let's try it all right here we go the color of paradise
after that big buildup. Where are we? <laughs> Let me try this again. Wasn't that great, Tim? Wasn't that great? It's my favorite film. Did you love it? It, it was great. So yeah. much action. It, 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 <laughs> something happened. Well, come on. <laughs> now you're you're being silly now. Come on. Now what what was going on? Tell me what was going on. You're a blind person and you're sitting there in the movie theater. What what was going on? What do you think? You know, there was leaves rustling. Leaves I could hear birds. Rustling. So uh, we're in a Tim, forest. Tim, maybe? Tim heard birds. What nothing gets past that guy. Uh, <laughs> are leaves rustling, birds? What else? Um, you know, it sounded like maybe somebody walking through those leaves. Walking. Um, uh -huh. and uh, something maybe they were dragging something. There, dragging. You know, there was a lot Ooh. of uh, a lot of commotion, right? There was uh -huh. a lot of uh -huh. some kind of struggling. I heard a little yeah. bit of vocalizations struggling. from somebody. Ooh, Ooh yeah. You know what I think, Tim? I think I think you don't have a clue as to what as to what's going on. And imagine a blind person, a totally blind person, in the movie theater, twenty five years ago, with their family, with their friends. I, that was two and a half minutes. It felt like it was twenty minutes or something, right? After thirty seconds, I guarantee you that blind person would be out of there. This is I. I don't. I'm not getting it. This is not working. Or, or they would be with the elbow. They, you know, what's going on? What's going on? Hey, what's going on? <laughs> to their friend, and their friend is going to well, whisper, whisper, and then everybody around them goes, "Hey, quiet! This is a movie. What are you?" And it's a mess. It's everything. It's, you've ruined the experience for people sitting around you, et cetera, et cetera. <sighs> what to do? What to do? It really didn't make any sense. Um, let's try something though. Let's, let's, um, listen to it again. I'm, I'm going to, how long is this program, Tim? This goes on for like several hours, right? We've got time. Well, I'm, cause I'm going to, I'm going to make you sit through this again, but this time we're, you're still blind, no image, 
I'm going to play the same segment, but this time with the audio description that I wrote, actually, and voiced when this was broadcast on national television, ABC, about 20 years ago. Now, listen carefully to the words. What can you, will it help at all? I don't know, because you were at sea there, Tim. I mean, uh, you're a good guy, I don't know, but you just didn't. Let's let's <laughs> see if this will make a difference. Let's try to see by listening. Muhammad kneels and taps his hands through the thick round cover of brown curled leaves. A scrawny nestling struggles on the ground near Muhammad's hand. His palm hovers above the baby bird. He lays his hand lightly over the tiny creature. Smiling, Muhammad curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. He stands and strokes its nearly featherless head with a fingertip. Muhammad starts as the bird nips his finger. He taps his finger on the chick's gaping beak. He tilts his head back, then drops it forward. Muhammad tips the chick into his front shirt pocket. Wrapping his legs and arms around a tree trunk, Muhammad climbs. He latches onto a tangle of thin upper branches. His legs flail for a foothold. Muhammad stretches an arm between a fork in the trunk of the tree and wedges in his head and shoulder. His shoes slip on the rough bark. He wraps his legs around the lower trunk, then uses his arms to pull himself higher. He rises into thicker foliage and holds onto tangles of smaller branches. Gaining his footing, Muhammad stands upright and cocks his head to one side. An adult bird flies from a nearby branch. Muhammad extends his open hand. He touches a branch and runs his fingers over wide green leaves. He pats his hand down the length of the branch. His fingers trace the smooth bark of the upper branches, search the network of connecting tree limbs, and discover their joints. Above his head, Muhammad's fingers find a dense mass of woven twigs, a bird's nest. Smiling, he removes the chick from his shirt pocket and drops it gently into the nest beside another fledgling. He rubs the top of the chick's head with his index finger. Muhammad wiggles his finger like a worm and taps the chick's open beak. Smiling, he slowly lowers his hand. Aww. Aww. And didn't that feel a little shorter, Tim? To, it did. To you? What's, what's that about? That's kind of an interesting, we could study that, I think, perhaps. Yeah, um, it, it made some sense this time. Did, did, it, did it communicate to you, Tim? Did you get an idea? It did. He's he's not dragging something through the forest That's, now. <laughs> what what happened to the body he was dragging or whatever? Right. That's right. That's right. Sometimes people will say, "Well, they're they're at the seashore," uh, you know, <laughs> because they figure the birds are seagulls or something. And there's no water. There's no water. But let me let me ask you something. Then this is a this is a, a just an excerpt, short excerpt from the middle of the film. Muhammad, the the boy, uh, that's the star of the film his image was already described but speaking of self-description he was already described earlier in the film what he looks like now you you heard of course that he's uh, uh he has a shirt on with a pocket he's got shoes on uh he has pants on i will attest to that um but just from you were listening closely i know listening to the description of his interaction with the tree and his environment and the bird and such. What what do you know about Muhammad? What what can you tell me, Tim? What do you what's he like? You know, I I of course you you just just described him as a young boy, but you know, I I listened a little closer to his sounds this time and you know could tell he was was younger, maybe 10 or 12 years old, okay. just by the okay. the pitch of his voice. Okay. Um, you know, maybe maybe boots or, you know, cause you could kind of yeah. hear the, the scruff, the shuffling on the tree since shoes, we now yeah. know he was climbing a tree. So maybe, sure. uh, 
maybe some boots of some kind. Um, can't tell how far up a tree he climbed, but it yeah. definitely took him a little bit of time to sure. uh, to get to that branch. And, and what what's he like? What kind of young man is he? You know, I yeah, but I don't know, right? Just um, from having heard, you know, what he did, his interaction with the bird, the environment, the tree. Any any clues there? I I know he wears a shirt with a pocket. Right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a t-shirt with a pocket or a, or a dress shirt with a pocket, but. Uh, but something with a pocket. Sure. Well, sometimes people will say, well, uh, yeah, he's a young boy. Very good. Um, he, um, they'll say, oh, he's, he's empathetic. He, he, uh, he likes nature. He, he's uh, sensitive. He's, he's trying to save the little bird, you know, um, and, uh, oh, he's agile. He's, he's climbing a tree, right? I don't climb trees very often. I, uh, you know, so, I couldn't do that. So, and, and all of that's true. All of that's true. But I think you're going to be surprised and everybody who has access to this image will be surprised in about 10 or 15 seconds. I'm going to, I'm going to put you through this once more, but this time I like this part, Tim, because this is where I, 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 <laughs> I give sight I restore sight to everybody uh, who's listening here. Not because you, if you had sight to begin with, now I will restore sight because I'm going to play the same excerpt, but this time with the image and the original soundtrack and with the the audio description. Um, think about it. Think about the images that were described. Think about things that were not described. Think about the words that were used. And we'll, we'll go through that a little bit uh, afterwards. But... Um, I think you're going to have a little surprise about 10, 15 seconds in. Let's try it. Muhammad kneels and taps his hands through the thick round cover of brown curled leaves. A scrawny nestling struggles on the ground near Muhammad's hand. His palm hovers above the baby bird. He lays his hand lightly over the tiny creature. Smiling, Muhammad curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. He stands and strokes its nearly featherless head with a fingertip. Muhammad is blind. Muhammad starts as the bird nips his finger. He taps his finger on the chick's gaping beak. He tilts his head back, then drops it forward. Muhammad tips the chick into his front shirt pocket. Wrapping his legs and arms around a tree trunk, Muhammad climbs. He latches onto a tangle of thin upper branches. His legs flail for a foothold. Muhammad stretches an arm between a fork in the trunk of the tree and wedges in his head and shoulder. His shoes slip on the rough bark. He wraps his legs around the lower trunk, then uses his arms to pull himself higher. He rises into thicker foliage and holds onto tangles of smaller branches. Gaining his footing, Muhammad stands upright and cocks his head to one side. An adult bird flies from a nearby branch. Muhammad extends his open hand. He touches a branch and runs his fingers over wide green leaves. He pats his hand down the length of the branch. His fingers trace the smooth bark of the upper branches, search the network of connecting tree limbs, and discover their joints. Above his head, Muhammad's fingers find a dense mass of woven twigs, a bird's nest. Smiling, he removes the chick from his shirt pocket and drops it gently into the nest beside another fledgling. He rubs the top of the chick's head with his index finger. Muhammad wiggles his finger like a worm and taps the chick's open beak. Smiling, he slowly lowers his hand. Yeah, he he touches everything. He gets to know his world through sound and through touch. His fingers find, you know, his his hands trace the network of leaves, that sort of thing. 
And, uh, you know, and, and just, just a little bit more, a little, uh, real quickly, I, I have a copy of the script for the audio description that I wrote, uh, just this excerpt. And I've annotated, annotated it because I think uh, there, there's some points here about audio description that I could bring out that I think are important. Right, the first line, he taps his hands through the thick ground cover of brown curled leaves. Brown curled leaves. What does that tell you? What does that show you, I should say? It shows you that it's autumn. We don't tell you it's autumn. We show you. Audio description, we describe, we don't explain. We show, we don't tell, you know. And brown, color, has been shown to be important to people with low vision. Even people who are congenitally blind, they grow up in the world and they have their own uh, experience of color. And uh, as we all do, uh, in this country, green is money, right? Uh, yellow is cowardice, et cetera, et cetera. A little bit later, there's some gasping and chirping just for two seconds. And then immediately we come in with the description. Timing, especially for performing arts and for media, timing is critical in the crafting of description because we weave the descriptive language around a film's sound elements. And then later, uh, he curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. Yeah, he, he doesn't grab it. He doesn't pick it up. He scoops it. Vivid verbs help conjure images in the mind's eye. Uh, a bit later, he starts as the bird nips his finger. He taps his finger on the chick's gaping beak. He tilts his head back, then drops it forward. Muhammad tips the chick into his front shirt pocket taps tilts tips well as i mentioned earlier it's a kind of poetry a haiku description like poetry oftentimes is written to be heard alliteration adds variety it helps to maintain interest just a couple more ah an adult bird flies from a nearby branch you know what to include there we see so much and it's not possible for us to describe everything it, and, and in fact, you don't want to. You want to zero in on the images that are important. What is the artist telling us? So we want to edit from what we see, choose the most important things to describe. That, that bird flying from a nearby branch, that's important because the adult bird returns in the next scene. So we've watched the movie and we get a sense. Maybe that was a bit of foreshadowing on the part of the director. And then finally, at the end, he rubs the top of the chick's head with his index finger, not his pinky, not his thumb, his index finger, be specific, you know, precision creates images. And then at the very end, Muhammad wiggles his finger like a worm, like a worm. That's a simile. And similes can paint pictures, sometimes describing something that's not even there. There's no worm there. But alluding to that image, sometimes describing something that's not there helps people see what is there. So that's a little bit about uh, our audience for audio description and a little bit about uh, uh, audio description itself and uh, the, the techniques that we use. Uh, so anyway, that's a bit of a, uh, a bit of description dis de demonstration for you. Thank you, Joel. And, um, uh, you know, and for that that vivid picture uh quite literally right as we describe sure. images um i did want to to um jump to some of our own panel for a minute and just give them Good. a chance so um harshid uh do you want to jump in for a minute absolutely uh, i just wanted to say thank you to dr snyder uh, i was first in contact or knew of you in 2017 during uh -huh. the audio description project adp project and um the the what i took away from that meeting just to listen to it there after post is the ability to contact your representatives or your fcc and such to ensure that we do have audio description uh and, and you know we've we've kind of come a long way from 2017 to now but um my question to you for present day is how do we mitigate some of what is becoming ai and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence to human beings because i know we, we've talked about this in our adp acb meetings and such in the past but for our audience here at office hours how would you uh, entail some of that uh, of your feelings with audio, ai and all of that 
That's a great question, Harshid. And thank you for mentioning the Absolutely. audio description project. Um, this is an initiative of the American Council of the Blind, which I founded with ACB about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, we have conferences that you know about, of course. We give awards for the best in description. We uh, have a website that is extremely valuable. Everything you want to know about audio description and where it is and how to access it, adp.acb.org. A little plug there. Um, we have um, uh, I mentioned we give awards, we have conferences, we have training in audio description. Um, in fact, this August, we will do our 22nd Audio Description Institute, five days with Joel. So if you did not enjoy this hour with Joel, you won't enjoy five days, I guarantee you. Uh, we even have a contest where we ask blind kids to write reviews of described videos. They, they send it in an audio file or they type something out over, over the, the net or they send it in Braille even. Uh, and we give awards to the best reviews uh, and what they, they, they really are thinking about how the description is done. So, but, but with respect to AI, um, boy, that's a hot topic. Uh, not just with respect to audio description, but worldwide in so many uh, endeavor endeavors. The um, the main thing that comes up with respect to description is, well, gee, um, there's so much video out there. There's so many professional commercial films out there. How could we make them all accessible? That would that would require that would cost something. Um, and then what about video on YouTube and such? Um, whoa, who's going to describe those? Literally millions of videos that are there. Let's use text to speech. Let's use AI. Let's let just just feed a script into the machine and you hear a mechanical voice. Well, I will grant that text to speech, that kind of AI has gotten a lot better. Sometimes you can't really tell is that a human or is that a machine speaking? But that's really not the point. As far as audio description is concerned, people who are blind, they use AI all the time. They use text to speech all the time to read their email, uh, to, to hear a, a, a letter, or a book, or whatever it is. Um, I don't know that they want to hear that mechanical, if you will, voice, even a, a quality one, when they experience a drama, a comedy. And I submit to you as a, as a member of SAG AFTRA for 45 years, uh, television and radio artists were on strike right now against the major movie studios, you know that. Uh, but as someone who uses his voice for audio description, there's nuance, there's subtlety, there's emphasis, there's inflection that is tied to how the piece is written. I don't know a text to speech uh, software that can do that yet you know i think it's it's important to have that human dimension and then going beyond that harsh it is such a great question um yeah there are programs right now you'll post an image and the machine will describe the image to you now based on what based on what based on other like images that have been described that are in its memory bank if you will well there's a whole there's a whole art and and uh, skill to choosing what to describe in an image. As I mentioned earlier, you can't describe everything. And how do you latch into what's the, the point that the artist is making? It takes some real study, it takes some real understanding. And I don't know of, a, of an AI program that can do that with the, the sensitivity and complexity that a human audio description writer can do. But it's a great question, Harshid, and it's not to trash AI. AI is with us, and it's with us to stay. But I'll tell you something. I, <laughs> I posed this question to ChatGBT uh, a few months ago. I said, hey, ChatGBT, tell me about audio description and the use of text-to-speech. Is that a good idea? Or whatever? I can't remember how I phrased it. ChatGBT came back with a little essay. And they may very well have been quoting me and pieces that I've written that are out on the web, came back with this essay saying, well, you know, there's so much video and it might come in handy uh, because there's so much to describe and can you afford to hire professionals? But, but the American Council of the Blind 
has passed a resolution saying no no text to speech please for for movies for dramas another element too is that audio description was created by a blind woman uh, it is it is not just for people who are blind it's by people who are blind some of the best audio description writers quality control experts are people who are totally blind some of the best audio editors are people who are totally blind some of the best voice talents for description are people who are totally blind so here again you know you get you get text to speech in there taking jobs from voice artists blind voice artists and that's a serious thing people who are blind have a 70 percent unemployment rate 70 70 we don't need to add to that in in any form or manner so anyway that's a long-winded response to your question but it's a good one harshit <laughs> and uh let's let's let laura chime in for just a minute here real quick laura yes thank you um so i wanted to ask you i know i i have a master's degree and i had to take a theater class and it was relatively difficult to you know get through without the audio description we know that accommodations are pricey but how do we get um educators particularly in higher education because as you just you just mentioned the unemployment rate um we're doing a thing on employment next week but Good. foreshadow that a little bit but you know how do we give our people the best chance particularly in education boy that is so important laura in fact uh just this coming week i will be speaking on that topic at the ahead conference in portland oregon association for higher education and disability laura knows it and um i'll be speaking to that very very you know i think there in higher education, we need to retrain our professors, professors, teaching assistants, so that they do, that they self-describe. We were talking about self-description earlier. I'm not talking about, you know, what the guy looks like. Do you care really about that necessarily? No. If he's going to present images, he needs to describe them. Because you can't hire a describer to be with you in every class, you know. Um, their their personal assistants need to be trained in audio description, productions on campus, that play that you had to see, or a video. They can't give it to a blind person and say, "Now tell me about it." Write a paper about it without description. No, it's got to have description and even presented productions on campus. Um, you could export all of this to community uh, theaters in, the, in, the, in that community where the college is, is, uh, um, is based. And in coursework, you know, it's not just a matter of disability studies or audiovisual translation. This should be studied in creative writing. Um, this should be studied in theater programs, in media arts. You know, every filmmaker should study audio description in film school because it, Traditional audio description is post-production. It's a post-production activity like dubbing and su subtitles. So a lot of film people don't even know about it. Uh, you know, in fact, I, years ago, I was describing, I had a staff describing uh, the television production of one of Woody, Woody Allen's films. And word got back to him that his film was going to be on television, uh, but there was going to be a, a, another soundtrack, uh, additional language. And he heard about that. And he uh, blew a bit of a gasket there because, wait a second, I wrote the film. I directed the film. I'm in the film. And you're going to add words to my film? No, you're not. Well, he contacted us and we explained. No, no, no. Audio description. Only people who need the description, want the description, can invoke that secondary audio program channel and hear the description. It's not going to be broadcast for everybody. And his reaction was, Oh, oh, blind people. Oh, post-production. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah, you know, he was already two or three films hence. He doesn't, he's made the film. Post-production is handled by somebody else. No, it needs to be studied in colleges. And and you're absolutely right, Laura. Uh, the folks on campus uh, and in high schools too need to understand more about description and television broadcasters, news broadcasters, weather weathermen, 
You know, how often do you have the, the images on the screen and the weatherman says, now look over here, there's a high pressure zone. Do it. Well, what does over here mean? If they simply understand description and they can say, well, if you look over here, north of the Potomac River, right around Catonsville, whatever, ah, a little bit of description helps the whole, the whole broadcast be more clear. Great Excellent. question, Laura. And we've got a few questions here lined up. I want to get into Great. those. So, uh, yeah. Mitchell, let's uh, let's go ahead and start with the first question. All right. First one coming in from Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada. Audio description seems fairly labor intensive. How many programs can one describer do in a single day session? Great question. Again, um, you know, we we figured that out uh, back when I was producing a lot of description for future films and broadcast television. It takes about an hour to produce description, a half hour to an hour to write the script just to get the script done, the first run at the script for about three, five minutes of film, an hour. So they were talking about a full day to do a half hour program. And then of course it has to be quality controlled. It has to be voiced. It has to be mixed and edited. Um, boy, we would get feature film people. Uh, they would, they want to add description and it, but it's like an, almost an afterthought and they'd send us the feature film. And so when do you need it back? Well, we need it back yesterday. Well, that's not going to happen at our best. We could turn it around in two days, something like that. Maybe have several writers working on it, but it is time consuming. And, um, going back to that text to speech, you know, there are some streaming services that are scratching their head and going, well, we, we've got such a, a library, a backlog of films. I'm not talking about YouTube. I'm talking about professional films. How can we go back into the 40s, the 50s, get all those classic films described? It would be easier to just use a, a, a text-to-speech voice. Well, I question that because, you know, to produce description for a feature film, the total cost is less than it costs for a film production company to cater lunch for the crew and cast for one day, one day. That's what the cost is. And of course, the film people are spending tens of millions of dollars on, uh, on promotion, that sort of thing. So I don't, I don't get too excited about, oh, it's going to cost a lot for YouTube, uh, for Facebook videos, sure. Uh, in fact, there there's a whole program out there called you describe, uh, dot, uh, org, I believe it is, that allows just individuals, fans of description, to post the clip to the cloud, write description for it, and then pair the two down uh, so that description is available for a particular you uh, YouTube video. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be done there. and uh, But I think... I personally believe in quality over quantity. I mean, some people will say uh, better some kind of description than no description, and I don't agree. I, I think that better no description than bad description because someone experiencing it for the first time is going to say, this is confusing. There's too much talk. There's, this is distracting. I'm, I, I'll get along without it, you know, and they don't come back. So that's a problem. Anyway. All right. Let's go ahead to the uh, the next question. And it's from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Are there AI functions for audio descriptions? Well, as we mentioned, um, yes, um, there are some films, television broadcasts that are the where where the script for the description is voiced by a text to speech engine which is a kind of artificial intelligence. Um, I, you know, I work with a lot of description and I work with a lot of blind people who really love description. And most often they can tell, they can tell that's, they're using a, a text to speech engine. That's not a human being voicing it. So yes, it's being used. Um, I don't think we're at a point where it can be used everywhere commercially, um, certainly not for feature films uh, and such dramas, comedies, where that nuance and subtlety in the vocal vocalization of the description is really critical. And um, uh, John Preto wanted to, to jump in on this. Oh, I think 
Joel, thank you for coming on. This is sure. eye opening. Eye opening for me, so, so to speak. Uh, I I get that. Joel. Uh, eye opening. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, uh, what's interesting is GPT four is multimodal, and they had turned on their image engine. Yeah. For a one day before they turned it off when they launched in March, <laughs> but but it is pretty darn good. If I took if I did a picture of of mitchell's at his desk there yeah. it would it would say this guy <laughs> appears to be an audio engineer editing audio if you take a picture of the contents <laughs> of your fridge it would tell you what you could make out of the ingredients of your fridge um if you put a meme up there it would tell you why that meme was funny and yeah. so it's it's the the progress that they're making on image recognition is spectacular. No question. There are apps that people can put on their phone and when they're shopping at a grocery store they they point the phone at that cereal box and it will tell them all the ingredients everything that's printed there i mean one little thing john you said well that appears to be uh, mitchell at his uh, desk or whatever appears to be three words unnecessary and it clutters the oral uh, landscape, if you will. And a professional describer knows that, hopefully. You know, we see, we see is just unnecessary. There are describers that still use those kinds of phrases. But uh, yeah, you know, for, for telling you what is there, um, sure, there are apps that can do that. But what about the how? For instance, in the arts, in the arts, if, if I'm describing movement, a dance, for instance, I could say, he raises his arm. I could say, he raises his arm. Two different actions, but at the same words? No. The one was jagged and rough and quick. A, a trained audio describer can tell you not only what, but give you the how. So in other words, you're not just walking Maybe you're sashaying, you're strolling, you're marching. Um, those are things that a trained audio describer knows to look for uh, because he has that kind of vocabulary and, and understands the purpose of the artwork. So it's not just that single image. It's does marching echo other things in the, in the drama, uh, perhaps. Those are things that um, I don't think uh, ChatGBT is is quite capable of doing yet. And uh, Brendan wanted to to chime in on this. Brendan, oh good. Where is Brendan? Yes, I just don't think. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't think we have a good enough description um, with the AI yet. Um, I do expect that's not going to happen until hopefully until Skynet. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I think I, it'll be a while. Yep. Yep. Can, uh, I, can, can I add one quick thing? One quick thing. In. Tim, yes, John. can I go yes, ahead? John. Yep. So, ahead, John. so my dad and brother are both radiologists, and I what I see happening is this: I think that the AIs are going to be like a co-pilot for your description for your describers, and then the humans will go back and 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 add to those descriptions. So Possibly. it's going to make them way more effective. Possibly uh, and productive and be productive. possibly. Uh, in fact, in captioning, many companies that produce captioning will will send a program to India where it is is produced very quickly. The text it's written out, and then it is then quality control checked uh, by uh, people uh, who are trained captioners, that sort of thing. And and uh, yeah, I could see it as an assist if if it if it saves time as opposed to adding time um just depends it depends by the way uh with respect to brendan's question uh audio description is used for people who are deaf blind too uh i've trained sign interpreters in audio description techniques so that they will interpret for someone into their hand tactile sign interpretation not just what is being said but like the describer in the pauses what what is the action happening so it's used for people who are deafblind or you could even braille the description and have it accessible to somebody on a hard copy of braille or a refreshable braille display very interesting 
Uh, let's go into the next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael. Douglas asks, I've heard of audio description used for live theater shows. How does that differ from describing broadcast content? Right. Well, there, there are there are similarities because it's still this concept of using pauses between bits and pieces of dialogue or critical sound elements uh, and being as spare as possible, being as succinct as possible. So there are similarities. Um, the biggest difference is um, in preparation is one thing. Uh, with a video, usually you're able to stop, start it, stop, go back and fine tune. With a performance, traditional audio description has been done by, oh, the describer goes to see one or two performances early in the run and then um, describes it maybe only at one or two performances of a six-week run. Personally, I don't think that's good enough. After 42 years, no, I think a describer should be a part of the cast and develop the description throughout the rehearsal period, talk to the director, talk to the scenic designer, costumes, et cetera, develop a description script that's available to be voiced at opening night. And then at every night, uh, if it's needed, if it's, it's literally on demand, so that a person who's blind can go to any performance. So that's, though I think that heightens or, or brings out the differences there uh, in performing arts description versus media. Thanks, Joel. Um, we've got just a couple more minutes. I'm going to try sure. to get through a couple of these last questions before we have to go for the day. So, uh, so Mitchell, let's go to the next question. Dave Troutman, Edmonton, Canada asks, if a person spoke six languages, would they be in high demand for audio describing? <laughs> That's great. Um, well, possibly, uh, possibly, um, because they could do the description in languages other than English, for instance. Uh, Netflix, Amazon, they produce description for many of their features, uh, their, their produced work in 12, 15 languages. So it's conceivable that if you're tra uh, trained in the writing of description, you've been through our Audio Description Institute or whatever, uh, sure, you could use the same principles in any of those languages. Now, I'm speaking of the writing of description. Whether or not you could be the voicing, voicer, the voice talent for the description, that's another question. That's another distinction, too, by the way, between performing arts and media. In performing arts, the person crafting the description, even if it's done extemporaneously, they're also voicing it. In media, almost always, there's a description writer and then there's a voice talent that voices it. And then someone else who's doing the audio editing and such. So um, yeah, knowing the languages, uh, that would be marvelous. Uh, it, it could enable you to, to uh, my own company, we've done description in 10 or 12 languages, but it never with the same person writing it. You know, we have to look for people that I've trained in different parts of the world, that sort of thing. So interesting question. All right, let's get one more question in, Mitchell. From Douglas Carmichael, it's incredible how the combination of sound effects and description makes the scene that much more understandable. For recorded content, do the sound effects team and describers coordinate their efforts closely? Oh, goodness. Well, not really, because again, it's post-production. The Foley artist, the sound effects people, are they're part of making the film. And the film is made, the sound effects are there, and then we take it traditionally traditionally we take it after the fact and add the description and we we're careful not to cover those sound effects that have been produced that's marvelous oral material or even the soundtrack you know they paid john williams a lot of money uh, to come up with a theme to star star wars you know who am i as a describer to even cover da 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 da, da. no i let folks hear that you know and then get the description in so we don't have the opportunity to work with the sound effects people unless the filmmaker incorporates description in the creation of the film. Then, then there's a real sharing and a real uh, uh, collaboration that's possible. Thanks, Joel. And uh, as we wrap up today, any, any last thoughts or where can people go to learn more? for all of the new aspiring audio description artists that we've just uh, created today? Absolutely. Well, I, again, I will mention uh, https colon slash slash adp.acb 
org. Uh, you can find out about our uh, August 14 through 18. We have a, a five-day Audio Description Institute coming up. Um, and if you want to take part in that, it's virtual uh, this year, this, this time coming up. And, um, uh, we would love to have you as part of that. Um, but I would, I would leave you with the thought that there's just no good reason why a person with a physical disability must also be culturally disadvantaged. No, no. I, in fact, I think, I honestly believe that, um, audio description helps people become more involved with their cultural life. Um, it, it, it helps, gives more complete access to culture and people become more, more informed, more engaged with society. Perhaps they become more engaging individuals, thus meaning more employable. So it gets back to our 70% unemployment. Anyway, thank you all for, for inviting me to be with you today. Thank you so much, Joel. And, uh, thank you for everyone for joining. And, um, just a few more thank yous. I want to say thank you to our sign language interpreters, uh, Allison and Karen, and just, you know, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, it means so much uh, for our panelists. Thank you for, for joining in and contributing to these questions and to the producers that were asking these questions. Uh, you know, without you, this, uh, this, this show would be a lot shorter. So we appreciate your input. And um, just a little bit of uh, uh, statistics to let you know the, the travel, the, uh, the journey that we took through our questions today. Uh, we traveled 54,197 miles, eight, over 87,000 kilometers. Uh, that's about 2.2 times around the Earth just in our Q&A today. So uh, uh, thank you to everyone for, for joining us and uh, follow along office hours throughout the week. And please join us next week for Accessibility Saturdays. Thank you. Everyone forget to thank our crew. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tim. This is great. Do you guys uh, make a recording of these uh, programs available? It goes out to the Office Hours Global YouTube stream. Oh, like, good. Okay. Like immediate, like we were streaming live to YouTube today. Got it. So I could just go to YouTube and see the uh, the program. Yes. Great. Um, Thank you, Laura. That's, Thank you that's, for coming. That's why I, that's, I was a little bit concerned about possibly getting flagged when you were doing that last part of the demo, but oh. I haven't seen anything from our crew saying. No, uh, that, that clip is on YouTube. Uh, it hasn't been, ever been questioned or challenged. Very good. So.